This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a drama, mystery, sci-fi film called The Jacket. Spoilers ahead. Watch out. Take care. In 1991, American troops conduct a fiery raid at the height of the Gulf War at an Iraqi camp. Jack Starks is bothered to see a young boy among the detained Iraqis, but another soldier tells him that it's not their problem. Jack tries to talk to the boy to quell his fear, but the child pulls out a gun and shoots Jack in the head. The medics declare him dead in the morning, but they notice his eyes moving. So, they immediately call the doctor. Jack soon recovers, but now suffers from retrograde amnesia. Jack becomes a vagabond a year after returning to the US. While walking down a snowy road, Jack comes across a stranded mother and daughter. Jack tries to talk to the mother, Jean, but she seems intoxicated, so he proceeds to fix her pickup truck. As he works on the truck, the child, Jackie, notices his dog tags. After Jack explains what they are, Jackie asks if she could have them, so he gives them to her. Jack gets the truck running as Jean starts to become aware of what's happening. Jackie hugs Jack for fixing the truck, but Jean tells him to get away from her daughter. Jack goes on his way and tries to hitch a ride to Canada. Later, a man picks him up and offers to take him to the border. After driving a few miles, a cop pulls him over for an unknown reason. Jack's amnesia strikes, and he ends up as a suspect for the police officer's murder. During the trial, a doctor notes that Jack has Gulf War Syndrome, and he might be blocking his memory of the murder. Jack testifies that someone else was with him, but admits that he can't remember the incident clearly. A ranking military officer argues that Jack cannot be held responsible for his actions if he killed the cop because of his psychological disorder. The court finds Jack not guilty of the crime, but he's declared insane and committed to a psychiatric institution in Alpine Grove. Soon, Jack is taken to the asylum where he spends most of his time in bed waiting for the nurses to give him his medication. One night, a nurse named Harding and Damon barge into his room and inject him with an unknown substance. They then take him to the basement and put him in a straitjacket before locking him inside a morgue drawer. Inside, Jack experiences several flashbacks of his past. He pleads to be let out after he gets a vision of the time he got shot in the head and the day the police officer was killed. Moments later, Dr. Thomas Becker instructs the nurses to get him out of the drawer and take him back to his room. The following day, another patient named Rudy McKenzie approaches Jack and tries to engage him in a conversation. Jack is not interested in talking, but Rudy is persistent. So, he asks him why he was committed to the asylum. Rudy reveals that he attempted to kill his wife 30 times, but he claims that he never planned on doing it. That night, the nurses bring Jack to the basement for another session at the drawer. Becker is relieved that Jack seems more cooperative, but he is surprised when Jack suddenly grabs a straitjacket and hits him in the face with it. In his anger, Becker leaves the basement without telling the nurses how long Jack should stay inside the drawer. Dr. Hopkins approaches Becker to express his concerns about how they're treating Jack. Becker assures him that he's only giving the patient some medication to get rid of his violent proclivities. When Hopkins returns to the morgue, he hears Jack begging for them to let him out. But Hopkins doesn't want to defy Becker's orders, so he just leaves him there. After experiencing flashes of his past, Jack suddenly finds himself at a gas station. A woman comes out of a diner and notices him as she walks to her car. Before driving away, the woman warns Jack that he wouldn't be able to get a cab because it's Christmas Eve. When the woman offers him a ride, Jack gets in her car even though he has no particular destination in mind. The woman takes Jack home and contacts several shelters, but they are full, so she decides to let him stay the night. The woman tells Jack to keep himself to anything that he can find in the fridge if he's hungry. Jack introduces himself, but the woman stops him and explains that she wants to help him, but she doesn't want to know him. As Jack looks for food in the fridge, he notices a rock with the word PEDAL etched on it. When the woman returns from a bath, she finds that Jack has prepared a sandwich for her. After eating their meal, Jack mentions the rock he found in her freezer. The woman is upset at him for snooping, but she discloses that PEDAL was the nickname that her mom gave her long ago. The woman soon passes out after a few drinks. As Jack looks around the house, he notices his dog tags hanging on the wall. He realizes that the woman is Jackie when he sees an old picture of her with Jean. Jackie confirms that she's the girl in the photo and discloses that her mother burned to death after she passed out with a lit cigarette in her hand several years ago. Jack is astounded to learn that it's the year 2007. Jack tries to explain that he was the man who fixed their car many years ago, but Jackie doesn't believe him. As Jack describes the details of their meeting, Jackie stresses that he can't be the same man because Jack died on New Year's Day in 1993. Jackie gets hysterical and asks Jack to leave when he insists that he's the man who gave her the dog tags. As soon as Jack gets out of the house, he returns to the morgue drawer. 
When Becker returns, he berates Hopkins for leaving Jack inside the drawer all night. He stresses that Hopkins should have used his common sense when he didn't tell them how long they should keep Jack inside. After the nurses return Jack to his room, Dr. Beth Lawrenson notices the bruises on Jack's body, so she confronts Becker about it. Lawrenson fears that Jack could end up like their former patient, Ted Casey, so she tells Becker to stop trying to reprogram him. Becker, however, contends that Lawrenson was the one who failed Casey. After her shift at the asylum, Lawrenson stops by a house to check on her friend's son, Babak Yazdi, who appears to be suffering from autism. Babak can't speak, though he is responsive when Lawrenson asks him to point to several objects. The next day, Becker notifies Jack that it's already December 26th because he slept for the whole day. After Becker leaves, he takes off his IV and wanders off until he finds the exit to the building. Lawrenson follows him and tries to convince him to go back inside. However, Jack insists that he doesn't belong there because he isn't crazy. Lawrenson knows that she will try to persuade Becker to stop his treatments, but Jack doesn't want it to stop because it makes him feel like a different person. When Jack returns to the asylum, he asks Rudy if he knows something about Becker's treatment methods. Jack discloses that he's going to die in four days after spending time in the drawer. Rudy advises him to calm down when he gets back inside to avoid the random flashes of his past. He tells Jack to ignore the past so he can focus on where he wants to go. Rudy and Jack stir up some trouble with the other patients during a counseling session to convince Becker to put Jack back in the drawer. Upon getting back in the drawer, Jack recalls the day the police officer was murdered. After the cop pulls him over, the stranger who picked him up immediately shoots the officer as soon as he gets out of the car. The policeman fired towards the stranger to defend himself, but he grazed Jack, who fell unconscious from being shot. The stranger then killed the officer and wiped his fingerprints off the gun. He throws it in front of Jack before leaving him behind. Soon, Jack gets back to 2007 and visits Jackie at the diner where she works as a waitress. During Jackie's break, Jack tells her that he needs to find out how he dies, so she agrees to take him back to Alpine Grove. At the hospital, Jack pretends to be his own nephew to convince the staff to give him information about his death. A doctor reveals that Jack died of blunt force trauma, but there are no other details about his death. The two ask him about the psychiatrist who treated him, but the doctor reveals that only Lawrenson still works at the hospital. When they meet Lawrenson, she discloses that Jack was her most memorable patient because he helped her treat Babak. However, Lawrenson couldn't provide more details about the trauma that killed Jack. After leaving Lawrenson's office, Jack and Jackie head to the basement to see if the drawer is still there. Damon, who is now a patient at the hospital, soon arrives and tells him that they're in a restricted area. Still pretending to be his nephew, Jack asks Damon if he knew how he died, but the former nurse only remembers that they found Jack's lifeless body in the asylum. Jack starts badgering Damon and accuses him of being the man responsible for killing him, but Damon claims that he never laid a hand on Jack. Soon, a nurse arrives and tells Damon that it's time for his medication. Outside the hospital, Jackie offers to help him track Becker down. Afterward, the two go to Jackie's house and make love. Later, Jack informs Jackie that he doesn't have much time because he'll soon return to 1992. Jackie begs Jack to come back for her, but Jack points out that he can't control it. Soon, Jack disappears while Jackie is asleep. The following day, Jack informs Lawrenson that he travels back to 2007 when he's in the drawer. Lawrenson is naturally skeptical and thinks that Rudy might be feeding him ideas. She reveals that Rudy isn't confined to the asylum for trying to kill his wife. Rudy is there because he posed a danger to himself by locking himself in his home for two months after his wife left him for another man. Jack, however, stresses that he doesn't care about the reason for Rudy's confinement. Lawrenson insists that Jack's accounts of traveling in time are part of his delusion. So, Jack mentions Babak and explains that Lawrenson told him about the boy in 2007. When Lawrenson visits the boy later, she asks his mother if she told anyone about her sessions with Babak, but the mother stresses that no one knows about them. Upon Jack's return to 2007, Jackie informs him that Lawrenson used a mild electroshock therapy to treat Babak's condition. She notes that the boy couldn't speak because he was having seizures. Later, the two head to Becker's house, but a neighbor notes that he went to church. When Jack confronts Becker about his death, the doctor claims that the treatment might have pushed Jack to kill himself. Jack points out that he couldn't have taken his own life because he died of blunt force trauma. Becker explains that he doesn't remember much about the day that he died, but Jack mentions some of Becker's patients the last time he came out of the drawer. Becker contends that they were criminals, but Jack points out that they were his patients and his memories of them are now haunting him because of the horrible things that he did. After Becker leaves, Jack suddenly feels weak after getting a vision of his past. He surmises that he's being pulled back to 1992. So, he asks Jackie for her address when she was a child. 
When Becker pulls him out of the drawer, Jack tells the doctor the names of his former patients and notes that the memories of his patients will stay with him for the rest of his life. Later that day, Jack tells Lawrenson that Baba can't speak properly because he has constant seizures. He reveals that Lawrenson will use electroconvulsive therapy to treat the boy, but Lawrenson argues that no one ever uses that treatment on children. That night, Lawrenson hesitantly treats Babak with a mild electric shock, hoping to stop the seizure. Babak convulses as she turns on the machine. Soon after she turns it off, the boy responds to her request to say something. The treatment is successful. When Lawrenson returns to the asylum the next day, Jack convinces her to take him to Jackie's home to personally deliver a letter to Jean. Jack notes that he's going to die later that night, so Lawrenson agrees. Upon their arrival, Jackie instantly recognizes Jack as the man who fixed the car. Jack asks the girl to call Jean so he can speak with her. When Jean arrives, Jack hands her the letter and tells her that it's important for her to believe it. Before leaving, Jack asks Jean to keep using the nickname Pedal for Jackie because she likes it. On their way back to the hospital, Jack asks Lawrence to put him back in the jacket. Upon their arrival, Jack collapses after experiencing a flashback of the time the Iraqi boy shot him in the head. As his head bleeds, he reiterates his request to put him in the jacket. In his letter, Jack explains that he first died during the Gulf War at the age of 27. He notes that he will die again later that night, and they will find his body the next day. He stresses that Jean will know he's telling the truth if she checks with the asylum. He warns Jean that she will die one day when she passes out with a lit cigarette in her hand. Jackie will miss her, and she'll grow up to be miserable like Jean because of her absence. Jack pleads with Jean to keep herself sober so she can look forward to a better life with Jackie. He encourages Jean to keep living because the only thing that she would want to do when she dies is to come back to life. Lawrenson and Hopkins manage to put Jack into the drawer before he passes away. When he returns to 2007, he sees Jackie leaving the diner wearing a coat over a nurse's uniform. Jackie drives past him, but she immediately backs up and asks him if he's okay. She points out that he seems to have a head wound, so she offers him a ride to the hospital. On the way, Jackie suddenly receives a call from her mother. Jack is delighted to hear that Jean is alive and she still has a good relationship with Jackie. Moments after Jackie puts down the phone, she asks Jack how much time they have left together. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.